Hello everyone and welcome to the museum. My name is Allison and before we jump into our video, I do want to acknowledge that Kelowna Museums is located on the traditional and unceded land of the Seal people. And today as visitors on this land, we get to learn all about birds and about their beaks. Now birds use their beaks for a few different things, with you know, grooming themselves and communicating and singing and all of those great things but they also use them to eat. And today, as we go around and we meet some of our bird friends, I'm going to use common household items that you might have around to pretend to eat like a bird. So this is something that you can also do at home. But before we go off and meet those bird friends, I have five facts about a bird's beak that might ruffle your feathers a little bit. So my very first one is the base of a beak is bone. So it's part of the bird's skull, but on top of that bone is a layer of keratin, which is the same thing that our fingernails are made out of, which is pretty cool. Now our body is always making keratin, which is why our fingernails grow and we have to trim them. And birds, they also make keratin all the time, but they aren't trimming their beaks. That extra keratin is going to their beak to help make sure that it stays nice and strong and to replace any wear and tear that they might have on their beak. So that's the very first one. The second one is that some birds, like my friend the snowy owl here, they have special bristle feathers around their beak to help them sense what is around them. So that's part of the reason why this little guy's beak is a little hard to see. And my third one is that a bird's beak is also its nose. A bird's nostrils are called nares and they use those nares to help them breathe but also to smell what's around them. Now some birds have a really weak sense of smell but some like turkey vultures have a very strong sense of smell. They have a very good nose. Fourth fact is that inside the bird's beak they don't really have teeth like you and I do but they do have a tongue. Now, not a lot of research has gone into how well birds can taste, but from what we know so far is that it's not as good as humans. So we have around 9,000 taste buds and birds will have about 300 to 400. So they can taste a bit, but we've got a little bit more going on with our taste buds. And my fifth fact is that many chicks or baby birds have something special on their beaks when they're born. It's called an egg tooth. And they use that sharp little tooth to crack their shell from the inside out and to help them come out. Now just like humans lose their baby teeth when they're really little, chicks will also lose their egg tooth once they're out and able to start growing. And with that, let's go meet some of our bird friends and check their beaks out. So our very first bird is a bird of prey, so that means that they are a carnivore. And here we have the bald eagle. Now bald eagles don't get their distinct feathering on their head with the color where it's white and they kind of look bald. They don't get that until they're about five years old. So before that, they are all this sort of brown and white mixture. And then on their fifth birthday, they get the present of having some nice feathers on the top of their head. Now eagles, they live all across Canada but here in British Columbia, we have the most of them. And that's because they like to live in places where there's forests near water. So that way they can build their nice big nests way up in the trees where they're nice and safe. And they can be close to water where there's lots and lots of fish because that's their favorite thing to eat. Now, depending on what's around, they will eat some other things. So they'll also eat crabs or lizards and frogs, but also other small birds and small mammals so they can really change up the menu if they need to. Now eagles, they are really great at hunting, but they're also a little bit of a bully. So if there's an osprey around, which is another type of bird that likes to eat fish, and let's say that osprey has caught a really great snack, the eagle will swoop in and bother them until they drop their fish snack so that the eagle can have it. And something else interesting about the way that the eagle eats is that it can gorge itself. So it will eat a whole bunch of food, definitely more than one meal's worth, and its body knows to slowly digest that over a few days. Now you'll notice on the eagle that it has a very sharp and curved beak. 
So they use that kind of like a knife and a fork when they are eating. And I have those right here with me. I also have some salt dough, which is acting kind of like my fish. And this is really easy to make. You just mix up flour and salt and water. It's basically like homemade Play-Doh. So if we were pretending that we were an eagle, you could go in, cut a piece off with that really sharp, pointy part of your beak, and then grab a nice bite of something to snack on. Now I also found these really fun pliers to use. Okay. And you'll notice that it's a very similar shape to the eagle's beak. So if you have a pair of these at home, they could also be fun to play around with, with your Play-Doh or salt dough or whatever you've got. So you could go in and pick up a bit of a mouthful. Sometimes you'll get a little bit, sometimes you'll get a lot. It's a little bit sticky, but that's the fun part. You kind of just get to play around with it. So there we have the eagle and its beak. And right before we jump off to our next bird, I want to show you the eagle's call so you can keep an ear out for it. And there we have the bald eagle. So our next bird is the California quail. And you might have seen these little guys dart across the street, maybe by your home or your school. And I once read that the California quail is a handsome around soccer ball of a bird. And I thought that was a very fitting description of them. And these birds, they like to live in places where there's lots of grass and trees and shrubs. So there's lots of things to hide under. And quails, they're not big flyers, but they do have wings. And they'll use them mostly to beat their wings really fast if they get scared so that they can build up some momentum to then dart in whatever direction they need to head. So that darting movement is one thing that they do to protect themselves. But they also follow the motto strength in numbers as another way to protect themselves. So you'll have a whole bunch of quails all raising their chicks together. So they all share responsibility of looking after everyone and making sure that everyone stays nice and safe. And strength in numbers is also very helpful during the winter time because quails don't migrate. So they stay here where it can get really, really cold. And to help stay warm, they all huddle together. So you could have up to 75 quails all huddling in and sharing their body heat. And quails are seed eaters. So they have short, stout little beaks that are great at cracking open nuts and seeds. And I'll show you some things that you might have around the house to pretend to be a quail. Okay, so here I've got some wooden beads, some dried beans, and some bugs because quails will also eat things like beetles and snails, things that can have kind of crunchy outer shells. Okay. And I have some pliers and a nutcracker here as well. So let's give it a go. And I think I'm going to start with the nutcracker and I'm going to go after one of these wooden beads. Nice, caught that one. And I'll see if I can get two at once. Now while, you, while you're doing this at home, you can have a little competition either with yourself or maybe with a few other people in your household to see how fast you can go. You can always try and do it one-handed, which I'm going to try and do with the pliers. So I'm going to go after, let's go after one of these beans. Oh, didn't get that one. Let's catch that one. I got a green bean and let's go after a bug. Nice. So that is our friend, the California quail. So our next two birds are perching birds. And they're called that because their feet are really good at grabbing onto little branches and perching on them. So we have the red-winged blackbird and the western meadowlark. So we're going to start with the western meadowlark right here. Right. So this bird has a very beautiful song. So they can sing for about three to four minutes and they have around 10 to 12 different songs that they can sing and I'll show you just what they sound like. Okay, so 
with a very lovely song to hear outside. And these birds, they like to live in open fields and meadows and pastures because that's where they can find lots and lots of bugs. That is their favorite thing to eat. And they have a really long pointy beak that they can catch bugs out of the air with. But they also do something else really neat with, it, with their beak. They, they do something called gapping, where they will stick their beak into the soil or into some bark, and then they have really strong muscles on the side of their beak that they use to pry open whatever they've stuck their beak into, and they can eat the bugs that they find underneath, which is really, really neat. And for the Western Meadowlark, both the males and the females have this nice, bright yellow coloring on them. So that is our friend, the Western Meadowlark. And we also have the Red Winged Blackbird. Now this one right here that I have, this is a male because it has those bright red feathers on their wings. Now females look very different. They are all brown with some gray and cream in them. They're really trying to camouflage and hide, whereas the boys want to stand out and be nice and colorful to flirt with the ladies. Now these birds, they like to live in wetlands. So you could see them at Rotary Marsh or um, at the bird sanctuary, which is close to the lake and right behind the hospital. Uh, but you can also see them along the rail trail because there's a lot of wetlandish area around there. And they also love to eat bugs. So they have another long beak that they use to catch bugs with. And they also have that, that behavior of gapping where they will pry things open to eat the bugs inside. And I'll show you what these birds sound like because they also have a really nice song. So you can keep an ear out for that if you are near anywhere with some wetlands. All right, and I'll put down our friend, the red-winged blackbird, and we can try eating like our friends, the perching birds. So they, since they love to eat bugs, I brought out some fake ones, but then also some elastics to act like worms, and then just a few other things that you might have around the house that you can use your imagination to pretend that they are bugs with. So I've got a couple different sized things that I can use. I've got little tweezers, which are a really similar shape to the beaks on the two birds that we just looked at. But then I also brought out some nice big pliers. So you can also see that it's a very similar shape. So let's have some snacks. I think I am going to go for a giant ant. And I'm very glad that ants in real life are not this big. Because it's long and pointy, it is really easy to catch some bugs. And let's go after one of these beads. Could be something smaller, maybe like a ladybug. And I think we'll switch over to some tweezers and we can go in for a nice big worm. Or we could go in for a little bit of a smaller worm. And let's grab one more bug. All right, we've got a grasshopper this time. Perfect. So those are our friends, the perching birds. All right, now our next two birds like to live in and around the water. We have the Canada goose and we also have a duck. Now geese, they live all across Canada. And before, they always used to migrate south during the winter time, because it got a little too cold here. But with climate change, they can handle the winter temperatures here now. So sometimes they leave in the winter, sometimes they stay. So that's why we can sometimes see them year round. And these birds like to live around water that's also near open fields. They like to have lots of space around them and their nests so that they have a clear line of vision if there's any predators that might be coming for them or their babies. And geese, they like to eat aquatic plants. That's one of their favorite things to eat. They will also eat a few bugs along the way, especially insect larvae, because they're a little bit softer and they're a little bit smaller, so they're a little bit easier for them to eat. 
and geese are very vocal birds. I'm sure you've heard them honking when they're outside flying, but they also hiss to express themselves. So if they're grumpy, they might hiss kind of like a cat. But I'll show you what their honking noise sounds like. Right. So we've got our friend the goose. So that's the Canada goose. And our other bird here is the duck. And I'll show you what they sound like, just for comparison. So def definitely a little bit more of a quack to that one. And this duck right here, this one is a boy. And they have those shiny green feathers on them so that they can look nice and pretty and they can flirt with the girls. Now female ducks, they are all brown and sort of speckled with white and gray and cream. They're really trying to camouflage with what's around them so that they can stay nice and hidden. Now ducks, their feeding style is described as dabbling. So that's different than diving. So with diving, it's a little more involved, but with dabbling, they'll just stick their heads into the water and eat what's around them. Or they might tip up and have their tails up in the air to really get some snacks underneath. And they also like to eat aquatic plants and they'll also eat some insect larvae along the way. Now for both the duck and the goose, they have pretty cool beaks. On the inside, they don't have teeth, but they have little bumps of cartilage that look sort of like teeth. And they also have those along the sides of their tongue. And those little bumps act kind of like a strainer or a sieve. So when they take a bite of something, let's say there's some plants in the water, okay, those little bumps make sure that all of the plant matter stays inside their mouth, but that all of the extra water just sort of comes out and they don't swallow that. So it's very similar to a strainer that you might have at home to maybe strain spaghetti in. There's also a sieve that you could use. But then I also have a little fine toothed comb, which acts very similar to that. And if you wanted to pretend that you were eating like a goose or a duck, you could have a bowl of water and you could have a, have a few different things inside. So maybe some fake flower petals if you had them, or there's some grass that's already been cut or leaves that you find on, find on the ground. Please don't pick things that are still alive, but you could put them into your bowl of water and then play around with a few different items to see how easy it is to get them out of the water. And for comparison, you could always grab a pair of tongs okay, where there's no teeth on the side okay, to keep the food in and to let the water out. And you can try grabbing onto the food with these. It would probably be pretty hard without those bumpy little cartilage teeth. And those are our friends that like to live in and around the water. Now our last bird that we are going to look at is the smallest one. So here we have the Rufus Hummingbird. And these birds, they like to live in open woodlands so that they have a mixture of trees and open spaces. Okay, so the one right down here, that is a female, so it's got the green on it. The one in the middle is a male and it's got the really shiny red right in its throat. And then the other one on top is another female. So you can see they've got some green, but there are also, their throats are very white. And they like to live in open woodlands so that there's trees for them to build their nests in. But they like having those open fields because that's where they can find flowers. Because hummingbirds are nature's sugar addicts. They love to drink the nectar out of flowers. So they'll fly up to a flower, but they don't land on it. They just beat their wings really fast. That's where that humming noise comes from that we hear. And then they stick their long skinny beak into the flower and then they stick their long skinny tongue in there to have a snack. Now before we used to think that a hummingbird's tongue was kind of like a straw, but we've learned that it's kind of more along the lines of a snake's tongue and the behavior of a dog drinking water, which is a really weird combination. So they'll stick their tongue into a flower and then it forks just like a snake's tongue. And then 
they will lap nectar up back into their beak, but they're doing it so fast, about 12 to 18 times a second, and they're doing it so fast that it, to us, it just looks like they are drinking out of a straw when really they are lapping up nectar a very similar way that a dog or a cat would lap up water. And since it's really hard to mimic a snake's tongue lapping up nectar, I've got a few other things that are a little bit more, more along the lines of a straw that you could use at home. So we have a turkey baster, and you could just suck up water with this by squeezing the top, okay. or you could do it with juice or water with food coloring if you really want to see the difference. Or if you live in a very sciencey household, you could also use a pipette, which is glass, but you'll see it's also very long and very skinny, just like the hummingbird's beak. Okay? And you can also use this to suck up some liquid. Or there's also the classic straw, either on its own or in a juice box works as well. And my very last thing about the hummingbird that I want to share with you is about the size of their brain. So they're really tiny birds, but they have a very big brain for their size. So their brain is about the size of a pea, and since it's so large, they have a very good memory. So they can remember where they found really good snacks before and go and find them the next day, the next day, and any days after that. Because they will drink lots and lots of nectar, but along the way, they will also eat really tiny bugs like aphids or gnats, but since their beaks are so small and thin, they can't go around eating big bugs. So they'll just have little ones if they come across them. Okay. And those were all of the birds that I wanted to share with you today. So thank you so much for watching our video and learning a little bit more about some of the birds that live here and the beaks that they have. Bye!